Thank you, Lawrence. Um, I'm not quite sure what follows from that introduction. Uh, <laughs> about the only thing that he did not say is that uh, I was hit by a boat while I was taking my morning walk on Lake Erie. Um, <laughs> but uh, a lot of you know better. Um, I am, in fact, thrice honored uh, to be here this morning. Uh, first, to be speaking at the City Club, the bastion of free speech, which is marking its centennial year this year, and we'll have something to say about that uh, a little bit later in the program. Uh, second, uh, to be the first speaker uh, in this series, which I think puts some pressure on me, uh, or at least my colleagues might think that there's some pressure on me, and I guess I agree. And the third, the third thing is uh, to get introduced by the dean. Uh, and fortunately for him, he has too much to do, so uh, he's not going to hear, uh, hear what follows. Um, now, I want to talk briefly on the subject, the First Amendment as a mask for privilege. That's a question. Uh, Citizens United, Grand Theft Auto, and some other recent developments. Now, when you think about landmark First Amendment cases, you think probably of two sorts of cases. Either cases involving dissidents or disfavored minorities seeking to assert their rights, uh, often using speech that is regarded as dangerous or offensive, or, second, you think maybe about the press and other institutions trying to hold government accountable. Now, we can see examples of both of these just with a kind of a quick survey of the landscape. Think about dissidents and disfavored minorities. You see them in the World War I cases, Schenck and Abrams, uh, for example, in which opponents of American involvement in World War I were prosecuted for expressing their opposition to the war and, and for perhaps trying to persuade other folks not to cooperate. We see this as well in cases from the 1920s, cases like Gitlow and Whitney uh, involving socialists or people even further to the left. Um, we see it later on in a series of cases involving Jehovah's Witnesses, cases like Lovell against the city of Griffin, Cantwell against Connecticut, and West Virginia State Board of Education against Barnett. And then there are cases arising out of the civil rights movement, some great cases. NAACP against Alabama, an important freedom of association case. Edwards against South Carolina and Cox against Louisiana, cases that laid the groundwork for the modern public forum doctrine. Uh, and then, of course, there's New York Times against Sullivan, which those of you who have had me in Con Law II know I think is the greatest of all First Amendment cases and uh, which I have never spent less than a week on uh, in class. Um, indeed, uh, if I were given half a chance, I would probably spend the best part of the semester. But then my colleague Eric Jensen would write another footnote saying that in addition to spending 10 weeks on Marbury in Con Law I, uh, that I spend at least 10 weeks on Sullivan. In any event, Sullivan's an interesting case because it fits in both of the categories I'm talking about. And, and in terms of the civil rights movement, one of the things that's important is that for tactical reasons, uh, Commissioner Sullivan sued four black ministers from Alabama uh, who were themselves prominent civil rights advocates. Um, now, let me turn to the second situation, the press and other uh, institutions trying to serve uh, as a check on government to hold government accountable. And there are some, some pretty obvious suspects in this area. Uh, near against Minnesota, uh, a case involving a, an anti-Semitic scandal sheet published in the Twin Cities, but which, when you cut through all of the obnoxious rhetoric, uh, 
made serious claims of corruption in the local government. Then there's the Pentagon Papers case, which we're, of which we're celebrating, uh, or we've recently celebrated the, the uh, 40th anniversary. And finally, to come back to New York Times against Sullivan, uh, on this side of, of the divide, that lawsuit and others like it were, in fact, efforts to prevent the national press from reporting on the civil rights movement. Um, now, over the years, the Supreme Court has broadened the range of protected expression, and it has narrowed the categories of unprotected speech. For example, all of the defendants in the World War I cases, Shank, Abrams, and the others, they all lost their cases, um, as did the political dissidents in Gitlow and Whitney, and as late as 1951, the leaders of the Communist Party of the United States in the Dennis case. But what's striking about Dennis is that although the defendants failed in their First Amendment defense, the court recognized that the dissenting opinions of Justices Holmes and Brandeis in the earlier cases had effectively carried the day. That is, the court recognized that those earlier cases were insufficiently sensitive to First Amendment values. Now, recently, the Supreme Court has decided a number of important cases in which the First Amendment has been invoked not so much by dissidents or whistleblowers uh, as by folks who might be regarded as privileged. Citizens United is a pretty good example of that. That's a case in which the Supreme Court said that corporations have First Amendment rights, not a new conclusion, but said so in a way that suggested that corporations under the existing regime of campaign finance regulation were somehow victims of invidious discrimination. Uh, similarly, uh, and I'll come back uh, to these cases in a little more detail, there was a case uh, late uh, last term uh, in which the court suggested that the Arizona so-called clean elections system, which effectively subsidized candidates taking public funding to a greater extent if they, if they were running against self-funded candidates uh, than if they were running against other publicly financed candidates. The court suggested that those self-funding candidates uh, were having their speech chilled. Uh, and the third of the cases from last term, uh, from the last year and a half, is a case called Sorrell against IMS Health uh, Incorporated, which struck down a, New a Vermont law uh, that was a restriction on commercial speech. As I'll explain in a few minutes, there are perfectly good ways to have struck that law, but what's, what is notable about the case is that the court suggested that reg many regulations of commercial speech should receive higher scrutiny, which portends a blurring of the distinction between commercial speech and core political speech, uh, a concern that was raised as long ago as Virginia Pharmacy Board, the great landmark modern commercial speech case, uh, a concern that was raised by that noted free speech proponent, William Rehnquist. Um, now, now, I want to be careful about defining my points uh, carefully. I do not mean to suggest that the court, by showing increasing solicitude for the First Amendment rights of the powerful, has somehow walked away from some of its traditional concerns for political dissidents, disfavored minorities, and so on. Indeed. Uh, in the last couple of years, while the court has decided the, these other cases, 
the court has also used its traditional approach, its broader uh, approach, to strike down uh, a number of mechanisms. For example, in the United States against Stevens, uh, the court struck down a federal law that criminalized the depiction of animal cruelty. And it did so by saying, we are not going to create any new exceptions to First Amendment protection. We have a limited number of well-recognized categorical exclusions from First Amendment protection, and animal cruelty doesn't fit in that category. Similarly, a few months ago uh, in Snyder against Phelps, that's the case in which the Westboro Baptist Church, the anti-gay church, uh, went out, goes out picketing the funerals of, of uh, American soldiers, uh, claiming they, or arguing that, that their deaths are signs of divine wrath because the United States has become too tolerant of homosexuality. Uh, the father of one of those uh, soldiers uh, sued the church for, among other things, intentional infliction of emotional distress, uh, won a $5 million judgment. The Supreme Court overturned that judgment, again suggesting that we should ha we sh that it, it supported robust kinds of First Amendment protection. And then there's, there's another case uh, just from last term that gives you, gives you the second part of my title, uh, and that's uh, Brown against the Entertainment Merchants Association. That's the case in which California uh, passed a statute that prohibited the dissemination of violent video games uh, to minors, um, and the court, by a lopsided majority, uh, concluded that just as we aren't going to create a new exception to First Amendment protection for depictions of animal cruelty, also concluded we're not going to create a new exception for violent video games, however we define that category. Um, now, so it's not as though the court has, a, has flipped its position and said we're no longer interested in the traditional kinds of First Amendment issues uh, that, that it has addressed over, over the years. But rather, the court has begun to suggest that the, that the powerful, as well as uh, the relatively less privileged, uh, should be regarded as having strong First Amendment rights. Now, the first of these cases, the one that the dean referred to uh, in the introduction, is Citizens United against the Federal Election Commission, which struck down a federal law that prohibits corporations and labor unions from using their own general treasury funds uh, for express advocacy or electioneering communications uh, within 30 to 60 days of an election. I don't want to bore you with all the details of the, of the McCain-Feingold law or the Federal Election Campaign Act, but that, that's, the basic, that's the basic notion. Now, as you probably know, this case was brought by a nonprofit corporation, Citizens United, which had produced uh, a film about Hillary Clinton, who was then running for president. Uh, the film is called Hillary the Movie. And to put it kindly, the film was very critical of, of her. Um, the Citizens United folks distributed this movie um, through theaters and DVDs well outside of the, the, the uh, election window. But then they wanted to make this available uh, on video by demand. Uh, and uh, they went to court seeking a, essentially a declaratory judgment that, that they would be able to do that. Now, there's some notable oddities about this case, um, not the least of which is that the Supreme Court, after hearing the first round of arguments in the case, uh, in which Citizens United said only that uh, it would be unconstitutional to apply this statute to them. The court decided 
sua sponte to get supplemental briefs and arguments on the question of whether the statute prohibiting the use of, of general treasury funds uh, from corporations and labor unions for political uh, purposes uh, violated the First Amendment. Um, so the court reached out to create to, to uh, create an issue that was not really directly raised uh, I as the case came to it. Um, but I don't want to dwell too much on this point. It, is a, it, it occupies a lot of Justice Stevens' dissent. Um, I don't want to dwell on this point too much um, because I think it's perfectly obvious that even if the court had decided the case on the narrow grounds that it came up under originally, that the court would have written an opinion effectively inviting the broader challenge, and almost certainly the court would have decided the broader challenge later on uh, in the way that it decided Citizens United. Um, but I do want to point out that the court went out of its way to avoid deciding the case on any of several narrower grounds. Um, for example, um, the court might have concluded that the statute didn't actually apply to Citizens United. Now, Justice Kennedy's majority opinion and Chief Justice Roberts' concurrence go to great lengths to explain why, in their judgment, there were no narrower grounds. On the other hand, for those of you who remember the Voting Rights Act from two terms ago, and there's at least one person in the room who does because uh, he wrote his law review note or a seminar paper for me uh, on that issue. But two years ago, the Supreme Court decided a case involving the constitutionality of the preclearance provisions of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and in order to avoid the constitutional issue uh, of whether the preclearance provision now has uh, lost its constitutional justification, the court construed the preclearance provision in a, well, a counterintuitive way, would that be fair, Ben? Um, a way that no court had ever construed it. In fact, maybe a way that no serious commentator had ever construed it. Um, was that intellectually honest? Maybe not. But if they could do it with the Voting Rights Act, you wonder why they might not have at least been open to the possibility uh, of a narrower construction of the statute uh, when directly addressing the issue calls into question federal laws going back over 100 years, laws passed in part at the behest of Theodore Roosevelt, who, by the way, had won the 1904 presidential election in significant part uh, with the help of money contributed by corporations from their general treasuries and then Roosevelt concluded maybe this wasn't such a good way to finance elections after all. Okay. Um, again, I don't want to belabor this. I just want to suggest that the court didn't have to get there. Now, now, um, the, one of the narrower approaches that the court might have taken would have been to say that this movie was not quote, express advocacy, which is this, one of the statutory standards. Um, indeed, the court seems to suggest that this wasn't express advocacy, but then it says that the narrative may contain more suggestions and arguments than facts, but there is little doubt that the thesis of the film is that she's unfit for the presidency, and therefore the court, go, the majority says, um, we're going to go straight to the direct question. Now, I don't want to go through all of the opinion here. You don't have time uh, for me to do that. Um, I, I do want to suggest that the major question that this case presents is whether we should regard corporations as having exactly the same First Amendment rights as natural persons. It's clear, it's been clear for 125 years at least that the Supreme Court believes that corporations do have constitutional rights. But the question that Citizens United and cases like this 
presents, is whether those rights are the same rights as you and I have as individuals. Congress passed a series of laws prohibiting corporations and, as I said, labor unions, although labor unions are not part of this case, and compared to corporations these days, labor unions are, uh, are not nearly uh, as, uh, as resource rich as, as corporations in the aggregate. And I'm not trying to make a political or ideological point here, but what I, what I do mean to say is that Congress had legitimate concerns about the distorting influence of, of institutional money in political campaigns. The majority opinion in Citizens United continually suggests that what we have here is a total ban on corporate political speech. But the majority opinion elides something that it, that it actually recognizes. And that is, although these federal laws prohibit corporations from spending general treasury funds for political purposes, corporations and labor unions are allowed to set up political action committees, which can, in fact, spend money directly for political purposes. Um, now, the problem uh, with this is that according to the court, it's really hard and time consuming to set up a political action committee. And political action committees are subject to lots of reporting requirements that are really burdensome. Fair enough. But the question that the court might have asked and taken more seriously is whether those differences are enough to call into question over a hundred years of federal law on the subject. Now, that question I think is important not only because there is an alternative here, but also because the court upholds various other requirements, such as disclosure requirements for corporations, that are also quite burdensome. So the question is not so much a difference in kind as a difference of degree. Um, now, how much difference will that make? Let me come back to that after I touch on uh, a second case from this one from last term. A this is the Arizona Free Enterprise Club Freedom Club. This is the Arizona Free Enterprise Club's Freedom Pack, that term that we, was just, we were just talking about, against Bennett. Arizona, by, uh, by initiative, uh, adopted a system of public financing for most state offices uh, back in the 90s. And it did so following a massive political corruption scandal in which something like 10% of the legislature went to jail for taking, for taking money. Um, the basic system is that Candidates are allowed to, uh, to raise private contributions, although, although they're, they're limited. Uh, they, are, they are also uh, uh, allowed uh, to go on their own and, and finance themselves without public funding. Um, if, they, if they take public funding, they get... A, they get uh, a lump sum for their campaign. But, and here's the, here's the, the wrinkle on this. Um, the, if a publicly financed candidate is running against a privately financed candidate, and the privately financed candidate spends more than a threshold amount, and it's not just the, can, the candidate, it's also uh, independent expenditures on behalf of that candidate. If the privately financed candidate has, has an, enough money spent on his or her behalf, then the public financing mechanism that Arizona set up gives the 
the publicly funded candidate additional money. Now, a number of people who either were running as privately financed candidates or had run as privately financed candidates said that this mechanism effectively chills their speech because in order to avoid triggering the additional subsidy to the publicly financed candidate, they would spend less money on their own campaigns and that's a net loss. Now, the Supreme Court, by the usual five to four split, uh, said that this was unconstitutional. Uh, and I think to understand this case, you have to understand a long running debate about campaigns and campaign financing that goes back to the Watergate era. And the, there were significant campaign finance reforms in the, adopted in the 70s because of some of the campaign funding uh, abuses uncovered as a result of the Watergate scandal. Uh, you have kind of two different views here. One is that money is too pervasive in politics and we need somehow to control the excess influence, the outsized influence of, of money in politics. And that pushes us in the direction maybe of public finance, contribution limitations, uh, disclosure requirements, things of that sort. The other approach uh, says that, as Justice Brandeis suggests in, in, in Whitney, the remedy for bad speech is more speech. In other words, we should, we should want to encourage people to spend, to say as much and to spend as much as possible, and we should have the government more or less get out of the way. The current majority in the Supreme Court is really skeptical about campaign finance regulation. You see that not just in Citizens United and in Arizona Free Enterprise Club. You see this in a whole series of other cases uh, in recent years. Uh, and the majority here says that this mechanism that Arizona has adopted effectively silences those candidates who themselves have a lot of money or who can raise a lot of money and be the beneficiaries of independent expenditures. That's a bad thing. The dissent, which was written by Justice Kagan, uh, says, hold on a second, if you look at what has actually happened in Arizona since this law went into effect, there actually has been more more people are involved in politics, more contributions uh, are, are being made. In other words, Justice Kagan says, there's no reason to think that the Arizona law has stifled political speech. Again, um, we, can, we can make what we want of that, but, the, but, but again, for our purposes, the point is the court, the majority of the court here seems to be more concerned with the possible chilling effect on wealthy candidates than on the overall uh, in involvement of individuals, of voters uh, in the political process. Now, I've gone on longer than I wanted to. Let me just take a, a, a minute uh, to talk about the commercial speech case and try to tie some of this stuff up. Um, Sorrell against IMS Health involved a Vermont law that basically prohibited uh, the sale of records containing prescriber identifiable information. That is to say, when your doctor writes you a prescription, the doctor has to fill out a bunch of, of forms. Um, some of that information winds up going to pharmacies and various other places and Traditionally, in many places, um, pharmaceutical companies uh, are interested in finding out information about how doctors prescribe. And they want that information in part so that they can sell more efficiently uh, to, to, uh, to doctors. 
Uh, you know, my dad was a family doctor who was making house calls into his 80s, and I can remember he had his house, his office at home, and I can remember detail people coming from the drug companies uh, and and uh, telling him about all of these new products. Well, um, data miners were getting hold of this sorts of inf this sort of information, uh, and were using that to help the f the um, help the pharmaceutical companies uh, hone their pitches. Vermont says, no, no, we don't, we don't think that that's a good idea. Uh, we think that uh, this invades privacy. It may, in, it may increase the cost of medical care. Uh, and so uh, they passed this law. The problem with the law that they passed, however, is that it has a bunch of exceptions. And that's where the law winds up being vulnerable. Now, the exceptions were for things like healthcare research, enforcement of, of uh, healthcare regulations, uh, drug laws, things of that sort. Um, when the case got to the Supreme Court, the court decided, had less difficulty with this case than it did with some of the others. This is not the typical five to four split. It's actually a six to three split. Um, and what's notable about it is, as I said, that, you, that the court seems to have ratcheted up the level of protection for commercial speech. Justice Kennedy says that this regulation, this Vermont statute, uh, is both content-based and speaker-based, and therefore it should get heightened scrutiny. Well, the Supreme Court had never before suggested that commercial speech regulations should get higher scrutiny. It is possible that the court could have reached the same result using traditional commercial speech analysis, and there is a way to read part of Justice Kennedy's opinion uh, that in, in this way. But he kind of buries that while he goes on about the, the presumptive unconstitutionality of content and speaker-based regulations. But you, the court could simply have said that the exceptions themselves impeach the state's interest. The court has done that in a series of cases, not all of which involve commercial speech, but none of which applied what purported to be higher scrutiny. The court simply said, if the government draws a line, draws an arbitrary line, the very arbitrariness of the line might be said to be constitutionally problematic. Instead, the court said, we're going to higher scrutiny which may imply something approaching strict scrutiny for loss of commercial speech regulations. And that blurs the distinction between commercial speech and core political speech. I mentioned earlier that back in Virginia Pharmacy Board 35 years ago, then Justice Rehnquist dissenting said that the court seems to think that selling breakfast cereal or shampoo is the equivalent of campaigning for President of the United States. Maybe he was onto something. Okay. Now, let me wrap up here with just a few, a few observations. First, I don't know that the sky will fall even if you think that these decisions are all wrongheaded. I don't think the sky will fall for a number of reasons. For example, on, on the Citizens United side of the table, it seems to me that not all corporations are going to spend lots of money for political purposes because they face various constraints of their own that might lead them to limit how much they spend, number one. Number two, half the states do not <laughs> prohibit corporate spending in political campaigns. I don't know. I suspect that there may be, somebody may have studied this. I don't know what the results are, but I would, I'm not sure that the political process in the states that allow corporations to spend general treasury funds for political purposes differs systematically from the, the political process in the states that don't. That's an empirical question. I'd be interested in finding out. Um, 
I do think, however, that we might well anticipate some gamesmanship. There's always been gamesmanship in campaign financing. We've recently seen a situation in which an anonymous company was set up, uh, generated something like a million dollars on behalf of one presidential candidate. Then it dissolved, and it turns out that the fellow behind this, uh, this phantom company was an aide or a former colleague uh, of, of that candidate. Um, I think we can expect more of those things. Um, second, it seems to me um, money has been in politics for a long time. Jesse Unruh, the late speaker of the California Assembly, used to say that money was the mother's milk of politics. Um, and while we may wonder whether the court got things right in the Arizona campaign uh, finance case, uh, keep in mind that President Obama, when he ran in 2008, ra did not take public funding, raised over $750 million for his campaign, which was about five times what he would have gotten had he taken public funding. And however he, whatever his prospects may be for re-election, he's likely to raise a good bit more than $750 million for his re-election campaign. Another thing about, about the Arizona case that I suppose as a former resident of the state, I might be able to say, it may well be that this that, that this uh, subsidy arrangement for uh, publicly funded candidates who are running against privately funded candidates reduced corruption. But anybody who has looked at the political process or at least the policy outcomes of Arizona politics in recent years may be entitled to wonder uh, whether this is a model that we want to follow. Um, let, let's just review the bidding on immigration, right? The, uh, uh, the state has first adopted a law that imposes draconian sanctions on employers who hire undocumented workers, uh, then passed another law that effectively requires police officers to, when they stop anybody, to inquire into their immigration status, and uh, that one is... Uh, that one has been enjoined uh, by a federal district court, and which was affirmed by the Ninth Circuit recently, but there's more to that. And Arizona has also uh, passed laws about bilingual education that effectively sent state monitors into classrooms to find out whether teachers might, perish the thought, actually be speaking Spanish in classes other than foreign language classes. Um, as I said, uh, you know, that's, that's my little editorial comment for, for whatever it's worth. Um, and on the commercial speech side of the table, that's something of a mixed bag. I mean, the majority in the, in the, uh, in the Vermont case said that some people actually find that kind of data mining and, and uh, uh, prescriber information useful. Some doctors like it, some patients like it. It's not just the drug companies. Now, I think, in other words, the court seems to be, these days, a little more sensitive to the interests of the rich and powerful than maybe it has been in the past. It's probably unfair, but let me close with a couple of, uh, of quotations. Um, one uh, from uh, A.J. Liebling, the great New Yorker writer, uh, who observed, freedom of the press is guaranteed only to those who own one. Um, <laughs> and Anatole France, the law in its majestic equality forbids the rich as well as the poor to sleep under bridges, to beg in the streets, and to steal bread. Um, so on that note, let me wrap up and uh, open for questions. Thanks. You alluded to it that the, the first uh, major candidate to decline federal money was a Democrat. Mm -hmm.
I think that the one of the questions has to do with the level of public funding. Obama and I think George, I think George W. Bush also uh, did not take public funding, at least when he ran for re-election. But um, I think the, part of the question is the candidates have to decide: Can I raise more money on my own than I could get from taking the public funding? And if the disparity is is at the level that we're talking about, as a practical matter, we're not going to see presidential candidates taking public funding anytime soon if they think that that they have to raise way more than than the uh, uh, than the government will provide. Uh, and if their opponents are going to raise way more than that. Um, now, the other problem is, even if you go to a system of public financing, I mean, part of the reason that there's so much money in politics, particularly in presidential politics, is because the federal government has a lot of power. Maybe it has too much, maybe it doesn't have enough, I and mean, that's a whole other that's a whole other uh, normative discussion. But the federal government clearly has a lot of power. The stakes are really high. And if the stakes are high, people who feel that their interests uh, are going to be affected are going to try to influence the outcome one way or the other. And indeed, one way to understand what the Supreme Court majority has been saying in the campaign finance cases is that these reforms may be well-intentioned, but they're ultimately futile. Um, now, one thing that the dean didn't say, but which a lot of you know, is that I clerked for Justice Ginsburg when she was on the DC Circuit. Um, her husband was a very prominent tax lawyer. Indeed, <coughs> Marty Ginsburg testified before the House Ways and Means Committee during my clerkship on, on a tax bill. Uh, and one of the things that he said appeared in boldface on the front page of the Washington Post the next day, and it went something like this. The tax bar contains the smartest, most creative people in America, and if you give them a chance, they will do you in. <laughs> this was such a great line, not only did it appear on the front page of the Post, but I am told that within hours, hundreds of silkscreen t-shirts with this, <laughs> with this quote appeared at the IRS. Uh, some, some years later, just to, just to close the circle, some years later, uh, I used that quote in a footnote in an article that I wrote. Uh, and after sitting on my reprints for a very long time, because I wasn't sure quite what to do, I, at, at least at that point, I used to send, my, send reprints to the judge. Uh, but I sat on this one for a long time, because I wasn't sure how she would take it. Um, but I finally broke down and sent the reprint uh, and about three days later, a package arrived in the mail, and it was one of those shirts. So, uh, so I'm, but I do think that part of what's going on here is is some skepticism that even well-crafted, well-intentioned reforms of campaign financing will work. And although the court may be reluctant to say that, when it can retreat to the First Amendment, it seems to me that 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 may be part of what's going on. And that may also explain what's going on with the Arizona case as well. Hugo Black was something of an absolutist and, and tended to believe that uh, when the Constitution said Congress shall make no law, it meant no law. Mm -hmm. uh, I might not be that absolute, though I probably think Buckley was wrongly decided. But um, in the Citizens United case, we're dealing with in that case of a nonprofit corporation, but a corporation or labor union, let's mm -hmm. not worry, uh, using its money to speak its own mind. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about a campaign contribution. Um, and so that's kind of a direct prohibition on speech. I'm not even sure that, I, I mean, there's some distinction is the spending of money speech, and there's, there's some argument about that. I tend to come down on the side that if you if you give somebody else money to support their speech, it's still speech. But you might make that distinction. Okay, I, I don't. I mean, I'll grant you that. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to get into that debate. I mean, I I, I think that 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 uh, uh, money is, 
in these situations is used for speech, and that's probably a close enough hook. But would we be, be would it be more consistent with the First Amendment if we just said if money supports speech, it's speech and not regulate it, not prohibit it? Well, I think let me let me just make a couple of uh, comments in response to that. Number one, yes. Uh, Justice Black comes to us as the sainted absolutist. Um, now, there are people in this room uh, who know where I'm going, I think. Uh, there is a wonderful case called Cohen against California. This is the, uh, this is the case in which the, this uh, fellow goes down to the L.A. County uh, courthouse to testify in a, in a civil case, and he's carrying a jacket. This is the height of the Vietnam War. Uh, and he's carrying a jacket that somebody, one of his friends, has written on the back, fuck the draft. Um, and um, he gets, this fellow gets arrested. Uh, case goes to the Supreme Court. Um, and the opinion upholding this fellow's First Amendment defense is written by John Marshall Harlan II, the most conservative justice on the court. And if you're, uh, if you're into... Uh, uh, lit crit theory, uh, you, I commend Justice Harlan's opinion to you, uh, particularly the line that says one man's vulgarity is another man's lyric. Uh, <laughs> Justice Black dissented. Indeed, Justice Black had what, um, what uh, Fred Schauer, a great First Amendment scholar who's now at the University of Virginia, used to call the Freddie Patek theory of the First Amendment. Those of you who don't know, Freddie Patek was a little fire plug. He was about five foot four. Uh, he played shortstop for the Pittsburgh Pirates when they were good and the Kansas City Royals. Uh, he was a tough little guy, a really tough little guy. You wouldn't want to tangle with him. Well, that was Justice Black's theory of the First Amendment. He had a very precise sense of what was speech. And with respect to that, he was an absolutist. But a lot of things that you and I might think of as speech, he didn't regard as speech at all. Now, the question I raise about Citizens United is not are corporations, should corporations be allowed to spend money? The question is whether corporations should have precisely the same First Amendment rights to spend money as you and I do, because they're not natural persons. The laws as they existed before Citizens United, said if a corporation or a labor union wants to spend money, it, they can do so. But they have to set up a political action committee. Lots of reasons to wonder why that's not an acceptable alternative. I don't mean to suggest that there's no argument for the court's position. I do think that there is a principled argument for the position the court took. My only point is that I don't think that that was the only principled position that you could take in the case or with respect to that issue. Uh, and I don't think, given the differences between corporations, for-profit, non-profit, and natural persons, that the same rules should apply in precisely the same way. We do, in fact, put restrictions on what nonprofit organizations can do politically. If, you want, if you're a nonprofit and you want to engage in political activity, you cannot be a tax-exempt 501c3. You can set up, a, you can set yourself up as a 501c4 that does allow you to engage in political activities. Just as we distinguish between types of corporations, it seems to me we might be prepared to distinguish between corporations and natural persons with respect to how they engage or participate in the political process. It's not a question of whether, but how. Yeah, Steve. While these cases are typically decided by the Supreme Court, and while these topics warrant Supreme Court attention, there is, of course, no assurance that any case makes its way all the way sure. to the Supreme Court. Has it mattered and does it matter uh, through which circuit court of appeals these cases come? And is there any significance in this field generally to the varying circuits and their views? I'm not sure that it matters that much. I mean, it's true that the Arizona case came out of the Ninth Circuit, and, and people like to 
joke about, well, it's the Ninth Circuit, they're obviously wrong. They had this long track record of uh, faring badly in the Supreme Court, shall we say. Um, but, you know, if you want to look at a circuit that's had a hard time in the Supreme Court lately, look at the Sixth. Uh, there was a day last, th this past year, where the court decided two cases, both from the Sixth Circuit. Um, the votes were 17 one way and zero the other. And the 17 were to reverse in both cases, and the only reason it wasn't 18 was because Justice Kagan had recused. Um, but another reason why, I'm not sure how much this matters, uh, which circuit we're talking about, is that some of these cases actually don't come through the federal courts at all. Some of them come, I mean, it, it turns out that the cases we're talking about today came up through, uh, through the federal courts. And, and, and Citizens United had to come through the federal courts, and it had to come uh, up from the, uh, from the District of Columbia because the statute says that certain kinds of cases must be filed in federal court in the District of Columbia. Uh, it may be that which lower court, and, and by the way, Citizens United also came up um, uh, from, I think, from a three-judge court where there's an appeal as of right to the Supreme Court, so it's not a question of, of discretion, really. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it seems to me that that which court had the case may influence the chances that the court, the Supreme Court will take review if it has discretion. But I think we're talking about a court that cares a lot about these issues. Uh, I think everybody on the court cares a lot about these issues, despite the disagreements among the justices about how to draw lines. Aren't you somewhat encouraged, though, about with, Fel with the decision in Phelps and the animal case that the court is at least not? Yeah, well, uh, as I said at the outset, I mean, I, I'm making, I hope, a narrow point. Um, maybe some of my recent students will suggest that this just reflects my instinct for the capillary. But, um, but I do mean to make a fairly narrow point. Uh, I agree. I said it. I said early on. The court is, on traditional sorts of First Amendment issues, the court seems to be quite supportive of First Amendment claims. Snyder, Phelps, even the, the video game case, uh, they're not very surprising given current doctrine. And if you look at them, they are all lopsided. Um, they're, the video game case is seven to two. Um, the opinion, the lead opinion is written by Justice Scalia. One of the dissents was by Justice Thomas. Uh, those of you who've read Scalia opinions in the past may find it interesting to, you, you ought to go read a couple of the footnotes in the, in the video game case uh, in which Scalia takes out after Thomas uh, for what he regards as a completely, uh, completely uh, improvised uh, theory of the First Amendment. Um, Snyder against Phelps is, an, is effectively an eight to one decision. Uh, Justice Breyer concurred on very, but, but very narrowly. Uh, Justice Alito uh, is alone in dissent. Similarly, in the, in the Crush video case, the, the, the animal cruelty case, Alito dissents alone. Um, so if you're just counting, in general, on the kinds of First Amendment issues that we might wrap up under, quote, traditional uh, First Amendment uh, doctrine. Now, this is a court that is, that is pretty solid. It's also a court, though, that has a number, that now has a majority of justices who want to extend that protection to places, that strong protection to places where it has not traditionally gone. And the places where it hasn't gone, it's not been the, where the court has just drawn a line and said, you get no protection. It's you get less protection, right? And now the majority of the court seems to be saying, well, we want to blur that. We want to blur the distinctions. Uh, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I mean, we, can, we can talk about. But I do think 
that it's significant that the court is, in fact, moving not toward a completely unitary theory of the First Amendment, but toward a, uh, but toward a, uh, a, a more, a more uniform view. Yeah, Pat. I'm interested to hear where in the story you tell about the First Amendment as a mask for privilege the broadcast line of cases fits in because there's, I would think that's another area in which the earlier questioner's point about absolute restriction becomes interesting because you saw a period of time in which scarcity became a rationale right. for actually imposing affirmative structuring of speech channels. So I would, I would think that you must have some views on, on whether or not we're going to see in the, in the cases coming to term in broadcast like FCC versus Fox as the court decides what the federal government's allowed to do with the internet, how um, the privilege question is going to play out okay. in that sphere. Well, I think that that the traditional rationale for broadcast regulation, and let's be clear, I mean, that, you know, back in the days before cable and the internet, uh, when we're talking about about just traditional over-the-air radio and TV, the the whole rationale for for allowing the Federal Communications Commission to engage in content-based regulation that would not be tolerated for an instant with regard to the, to, the, uh, to the print media was, in fact, scarcity. That the, the broadcast spectrum had only a finite capacity uh, and therefore uh, the government should at least, the FCC should, should have the role of traffic cop. In effect. Well, technology has overtaken that. There have been long involved discussions about the extent to which the FCC even has authority over the Internet and cable and things like that. It's pretty clear now that the scarcity rationale makes no sense. Indeed, back in the 80s, um, the FCC chair, Mark Fowler, uh, uh, undid, uh, not by himself, but, but he stimulated the undoing of a lot of the more draconian uh, sorts of broadcast regulations. Um, I, th if you want a prediction on the Fox case, this is the fleeting expletive case, uh, which the court has had already once before as an administrative law matter, explicitly left open the First Amendment question. Uh, now the First Amendment question is back. Uh, I think that there's a pretty high likelihood that that the uh, First Amendment claim will prevail. Um, I, and I don't. I suspect that it's not going to be a close case. Uh, I think that the court, and since the lower court ruled for the broad, for Fox in that case uh, against the FCC, I think that the court did not have to take the case, but has taken it precisely so that it, it will affirm. Now, before I wrap up, uh, I mentioned at the outset um, that one of the reasons I was glad to be here. Uh, today was because this is part of the, uh, the City Club's centennial year, and Patrick, I think, wants to say something about the Free Speech Conference coming up next month. organizing the Conference on Free Speech on October 10th. Um, it's going to be a day-long conference, and we have a bunch of really interesting speakers coming in. Uh, the first panel on the Internet is going to feature Google's policy chief, um, WikiLeaks's lawyer, uh, the general counsel of the New York Times and the, le the legal counsel for the Electronic Frontier Foundation to talk about the future of the Internet. Uh, there will be a panel on future free speech and terror in the, in the context of the war on terror, and that will feature Steve Dettelbach, uh, the ACLU's uh, the national security chief, Scott Horton, and some other folks. And that will be live, and including uh, Michael Scharf, actually. And that will be live broadcast from BBC's World Have Your Say, which will be at our stage in the Allen Theater. Um, there will be a panel on uh, free speech in the political arena featuring the uh, uh, White House Bureau Chief of the New York Times, the editor of Foreign Policy, and some other folks. And then delivering keynote addresses will be Juan Williams, who was recently uh, uh, departed from NPR and is now with Fox, and the uh, executive producer of 60 Minutes and the chairman of CBS News. So that's all on a day. I mean, it's a really kind of a packed schedule, but a lot of thought leaders in speech are going to be there. So if, if you're interested... <laughs> There's promotional materials floating right. around. And, and just, just by way of disclaimer, I'm on the planning committee, but um, you should go anyway. 